Coming up on Chasing the Natty, spring camps begin across the country, and we're going to tell you which position battles we have our eye on in the CFF landscape. All this and more coming right after this. Looking to Jared Stearns, who makes the catch and scores. What a burst! Trey Vaughn Anderson! As advertised, touchdown Buckeyes! This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everybody. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chase and Natty podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful Monday morning as you are getting started with your on your way to work. Or if you're a grad student like me, I'm on spring break this week, so that's fun for me. Probably not so much fun for our guest today, who I know for a fact is in that wonderful, wonderful world of real life, and that is Mr. Nate Marquise. Everybody, welcome Nate Marquise back onto the show. Nate, how you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Jared. Thanks for uh, having me back on. Uh, looking forward to talking some more college football and uh, spring uh, practice and, and a lot of the, the competitions that we see coming up. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like we're, a, lot of, a, a lot of schools have already been in spring practice for over a month. And so once we get some more news out of those camps and everything, we're going to be bringing that kind of stuff to you guys. But today, we're really going to try to focus in on some position battles that we in the CFF community are really going to be keeping our eye on throughout well, spring and really into the fall. Because again, it's not like these position battles are decided here in the spring. Um, but we're going to, we're going to keep an eye on them through throughout now. And so, yeah, like I pretty much uh, not too much else to say about that. That's pretty much all we're covering today. Um, but before we get started and everything, you guys know the spiel. If you're watching this on YouTube, pause the video right now. Leave a comment right down there below. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Hit that little notification bell. You guys know all of the little buttons to press. Um, in addition to that, if you're listening to this on podcast, take a look up above. Make sure you hit that little follow button. Make sure you know exactly when each of these episodes come out. Although it usually comes out Monday morning, you never know. Maybe we put out a little surprise episode every once in a while. I am chaotic like that sometimes. Even still, um, if you are listening to this show... Um, and you want to reach us. I'm at CFF underscore Jared on Twitter. Nate is at CFF Nate. You can reach either of us on Twitter. We are both pretty open to questions that anybody really wants us to ask in the DMs. And then finally, we are a part of the Campus to Canton family. And obviously, as you can see on the graphic on the screen here, me and Nate are part of the CFF team over there, along with Brandon Sanders and Chris Moxley. We're bringing you this podcast. Um, we're the official CFF podcast for Campus Again, but there is a whole host of podcasts that are being brought to you every single week on Mondays. You can you can join us on Chasing Natty with myself um, and the CFF team. It'll be on YouTube and on the podcast feed on Tuesdays. You can listen to Campus Life with Austin Nace and Colin Decker. That is the college side of the Campus Canton podcast. On Wednesday nights, you can join Devi Debate live streamed on YouTube with Felix Sharp, Matt Bruning, Austin Nace, and Chris Moxley, and quite recently taken over by the very chaotic Mike Valerie, which you guys have to watch those recent shows with Mike. It has been absolute blast. Nate, you can kind of speak to that. You were on the post show a couple weeks ago with him, right? I was. Um, I hadn't met him before, so it was quite an introduction. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a character for sure. He's a lot of fun, though. I, I kind of imagine he's almost like he's almost like the Eric Froton of the C to C team right now, as far as I can tell, where it's just like as soon as you walk into the room, you know who he is very quickly. He will not let you go two seconds without knowing exactly who he is. But even still, on Thursdays, you can join once again Austin Nace and Colin Decker on the Canton Bound podcast, which is the uh, NFL side of the Campus Canton podcast. New show on YouTube only, The Official, with Alfred Fernandez, Matt Powell, and David Nipple uh, on 
YouTube, it is a show based on recruiting from an analytics point of view. And then on Fridays, our CFF friend Brandon Sanders has started his brand new podcast, as well as the show will also be on the Campus Canton YouTube channel, the Future Freshman Podcast, a podcast dedicated to studying freshmen coming in as well as the crop of new recruits for the next year from a CFF Dynasty perspective. Absolutely check that out, y'all. Absolutely is a must, honestly, a must-listen podcast kind of going forward for anybody that really wants to dive into both Campus Scan and CFF Dynasty. And then obviously, we have some everyday podcasts that are being put out. You have the Daily Draft Report with Dwight Peoples right now. He is going through both offensive and defensive players, one every single day. So if you just want a quick and easy way to learn about all these guys going into the draft, go right there. And then Chris Moxley, one of our guys from the CFF team, has his own show, College Football Filtered, on the Campus Account YouTube channel every morning at 7 a.m. is a Quick 15 to 20 minute little show where he just brings you up to date on the latest and greatest news of the um, of, uh, for college football. So with that being said, that, those are all the shows and everything. Please go check all of them out. Nate, is there anything that you're kind of working on and everything that you want to kind of plug in here before we get started? Um, you know, nothing really at this point. Right now, time consumed with just researching, uh, you know, all the information that we've got coming out of the spring practice reports, uh, obviously some spring games coming up that, uh, our entire crew will have their eye on, uh, once those get going. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a variety of practice reports. And then after the spring, I will have the, uh, the follow-up to my, uh, pre-spring, um, stock up, stock down report with the post-spring version of it. So just kind of see, who uh, who the movers and shakers are of the uh, you know the of the spring camps? Yeah, absolutely. And if you haven't already gone and checked out Nate's articles from those stock up and stock down reports from the pre spring, go check those out. Nate did an absolutely fantastic job on those. All right, thanks, man. Let's go ahead and get started on like what we actually came here to talk about today. Let's get into some of these spring battles, and so we're going to bring you guys three battles that we're really keeping an eye on like the, the ones we really wanted to talk about today obviously there are more than just three for every position but we're really going to bring you three quarterback battles three running back battles three wide receiver battles and we're also going to try to touch on some that we haven't really talked about already so like we all know the texas tech qb battle is probably one of the the most important battles that we will see this spring and going into the fall because whoever has that job takes over the Zach Kitley offense that produces Bailey Zappi last year. We all know that we're not going to get too deep into that. In addition, um the Clemson QB battle, like that's a pretty high profile QB battle. A lot of questions of whether DJ Uyangalele is going to be able to keep that job. A lot of you are already pretty familiar with that. We're going to move on and try to discuss some ones that we haven't really seen too much discussion about. And the first one here I think we can really get into is the Liberty quarterback battle. Now, why is this important? Well, if you played CFF last year, uh, you remember Malik Willis was the consensus 101 last year in CFF because of his rushing ability in this Liberty offense. Last year, he went uh, through for 2,857 yards, 27 touchdowns. Pretty pedestrian QB passing numbers, but where he shone or shined was the 197 attempts on the ground for 878 yards and 13 additional touchdowns. That allowed him to finish as a QB 7. So you would think then that would say, all right, whoever takes over this job next is a clear CFF starter going forward. But Nate, we got three candidates here, Jonathan Bennett, Caden Salter, and Charlie Brewer. Which of these guys are you thinking is maybe the front runner here? Or like, do, do each of them bring something different that should tell us whether or not this job is going to be as CFF relevant this year? Well, clearly, from an experience standpoint, Charlie Brewer is, is definitely the leader in the clubhouse there. He's you know, he started numerous games or multiple seasons at Baylor. Uh, he was the initial starter last year at Utah before losing his job there. Um, so obviously he's got a ton of experience that uh, Hugh Freeze is able to add him to that QB room to, to fill that experience need. <laughs> Honestly, 
he's one of those QBs that, man, I wish Freeze would have waited a little longer before exploring the portal and got somebody way more dynamic than Charlie Brewer. He's just a pretty meh quarterback. I mean, he couldn't succeed at really either one of the places uh, that he's been at before. So he doesn't really excite me very much. Sal- Caden Salter is the one that, from a CFF perspective, um, from a Debbie perspective, everybody's kind of raving about. They really want him to to win this job just because he's kind of got that that high ceiling that everybody looks for. His rushing ability is, is kind of off the charts. He he's the most typical of the three uh, to to be that Malik Willis type, you know, that can make plays with his feet and his arm. He was a high four-star QB that went to initially signed and enrolled at Tennessee before getting dismissed there. So he was top top 15 uh, QB coming out. So clearly there's, there's a lot of talent there. He doesn't play well in structure. He plays really well out of, you know, out of structure. So he's going to have to kind of hone in his game. Hugh Freeze is going to have to coach him up um, to be able to play within that structure and Bennett's kind of the dark horse of the three. Nobody's really talking about him from a fantasy perspective, but um, I follow a lot of the uh, the Liberty um, pages and beat writers, and I would say right now he's probably the leader in the clubhouse to be the starter uh, from what I'm hearing over there. So um, that probably comes as a little bit of a surprise to a lot of people because he's the one that nobody's talking about. But uh, he's he's been with Freeze the whole time there uh, since he's been at Liberty, so he's got – at least the most experience within the Hugh Free system. Um, so he's got a little bit of intrigue if he were to win the job. My thoughts are um, really any three of these guys could win it. Uh, and and any three of them has decent fantasy potential because they got some nice receivers returning there. Yarbrough comes back, uh, Douglas, Daniels. So they got some decent wide receivers. Um, my guess is, is that Bennett gets the early nod and then – if he's able to be successful, they, they play UAB and Wake Forest in weeks two and three. So we're going to know pretty quick what direction they're going. If he can be successful in those games and he, he maybe holds on to it, if not, um, then I could see Freeze maybe uh, inserting one of the other guys. And obviously Salter's the one that's got the high ceiling. If he wins that job, that's that's a pretty big hot commodity. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'll be real. I don't disagree with you here too much. Like, I, I thought maybe you would like put uh, pump up Salter just a little bit more instead of Bennett. But I basically, when I was doing my research, kind of found the same thing. I think it was very telling last year that when Malik Willis came out of the games for Liberty last year, that it was Bennett who went in, not Salter. Salter only had two passing attempts last year, which I thought was very striking for somebody that a lot of people have been kind of pumping up. And again, I get it. Again, the recruiting pedigree is there. Again, former four-star, went to Tennessee, dual-threat guy, very Malik Willis-like in many different ways. Like, I think he's probably not as good as Malik Willis, but even still, like, give him a year or two in that system, maybe maybe things change. Um, but again, I, again, I'm with you that Bennett uh, coming in after Mal- Willis last year, I think, was very telling. And again, I'm with you. Like, I've been hearing the same things where it's just like, it seems like it's kind of Bennett's job right now. I, I'm glad we're both kind of agreeing that Brewer isn't as much of a threat to take this job as kind of some people were afraid that he might be. I think he's done. I think for the most part, Brewer's done. He's an emergency option for them. Uh, you don't go from, or at least it doesn't make sense to me that you would go from Baylor to Utah, start at Utah get benched pretty early on in the season and then just immediately transfer out and go to Liberty and expect the exact same thing to happen there. I don't, I, I think he's done. I think he's looking for maybe like a graduate assistant role or something like that going forward. I, I just don't see Brewer really taking the reins on this job, especially when you have two younger guys behind him that I think could really kind of provide more of an upside for a Q freeze. Am I crazy to think yeah. that? No, I think you. I think you hit the the nail there when you said upside. If if Brewer wins the job, he's probably the least sexy of the three from a from a fantasy perspective, just because um, his ceiling is. I, I do feel like his ceiling's lower than the other two. His 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 arm strength um, is very lacking. Um, his he's just yeah. I mean he's he's just a. He's just not a very exciting quarterback. I, I just it surprised me that that's the direction Freeze went. He could have, I mean, if he waited, could have got somebody like an Emory Jones or a Jaden Daniels or Emory Jones is still uh, available, right? Yeah, it, I, I just yeah, it's crazy. 
Alrighty, so that's the QB Liberty battle. I think Nate and I are both on the same page where we think that Jonathan Bennett, because of his experience last year, taking over after Willis and everything, and still kind of providing somewhat of an upside there, I think he is the one that ends up taking it, unless Salter makes some real big moves in this season, uh, or in this offseason. So we will definitely keep an eye on that one, because again, we've already talked about just the high, high upside of the QB within this system. Let's move on to the uh, the Southern Methodist QB battle. And for a lot of you who might have not been paying attention this offseason, you're sitting here wondering, like, what are you talking about? Tanner Mordecai is the clear starter there because he finished as the QB9 last year in fantasy. Dude threw for over 3,600 yards and 39 touchdowns and ran on the ground for 202 yards and two touchdowns. Like, how in the world could he possibly be losing his job to somebody? Well... Enter Mr. Preston Stone, a true freshman last year, former four-star and the highest commit, highest rated commit for SMU ever, as well as a player that has a great relationship with the now head coach of SMU, Rhett Lashley, who recruited Preston Stone to come be a part of the Mustangs. So, Nate... Obviously, we have Mordecai here who performed very well last year, but how much should we be reading into the possibility that Stone could take over this job from Mordecai? And is Mordecai, with him being taken as the... He's currently being taken as the... I should have had this up. He's currently being taken as the QB 13 in drafts. How much of that is at risk? Like, Are people getting a bad value when they take Matt, Tanner Mordecai at that point? So this is one of the, the few competitions where they've actually started, um, you know, campus started there in Dallas. So we're at least getting a little, you know, a little nugget here and there. And so far, Lashley's told the media that all positions are open for competition. He said that that includes the QB. So he's one of two things is happening. Either this is just total coach speak and he's trying to prevent one of them from transferring and if so, then I would assume that he's not going to decide anything during the spring and this competition will continue until August before we find out. Um, or two, um, he's for real. And the rumors that, that Stone was kind of nipping at Mordecai's heels towards the end of last season are absolutely true. So one of those two things is, is definitely happening. Um, yeah, I, I mean – the fact that Mordecai is going, uh, you know, in that kind of 13 to 15, QB 13 to 15 range for me is a little high, given that we know that this is, a, this is a pretty strong competition now, at least we, we have to assume so, because that's what he's telling us. Um, if I had to guess, I, I would say the most likely scenario is, is that Mordecai gets the nod week one and then has to perform you know, really well to keep this job. Uh, they have uh, Maryland and TCU coming up in the first four weeks. So they get a decent non-con there. Um, but I, I definitely, I probably wouldn't have Mordecai in my top 20 uh, at this point. So I, I think the other scenario would be is that Stone essentially beats out Mordecai here in the spring and we see Mordecai transfer over across town to TCU over to Fort Worth and, oh, dude, and love that. gets it going for Sonny Dykes again. So, which if you, if you own Stone and Mordecai, that's pretty much the best case scenario. Then you got both of them starting them and they go from neither one of them being a top 20 QB to both of them being a top 20 QB. So, um, but I, I think probably the, the, the first scenario is what likely happens I do know that if you if you take Mordecai, you invest that top 15 QB in him, you better handcuff him with stone, whether it be a best ball or even just a redraft league, um, especially if both of them are still on roster and there hasn't been a decision made in spring, which I, I don't anticipate. Yeah, no, I, I pretty much agree with you wholeheartedly. I am I, I believe Lashley when he says that there's a legit competition here. Because he probably isn't as familiar with Mordecai. He's more familiar with Stone. But he see, he saw what Mordecai did last year. So he knows that he can't just be like, well, I'm going to put my guy in there. Um, so there's going to be a legit competition here. I am a believer that Mordecai is going to hold on to this job. I do believe that he will be the guy starting week one for the most part. 
Uh, and that's why I still would be willing to invest top 15 QB draft capital into him. Because again, we saw dude, even at like without much of a rushing upside, was able to finish as the QB nine last year with the weapons that he had and everything. And SMU is still loaded at receiver. That's another receiver room that we really could have dived into here if we wanted to. Uh, we're not going to, but even still, like they they have a ton of great receiving weapons. So whoever starts here is going to probably be in that top twenty QB conversation by the end of the season. Um, but yeah, even so, like again, you're right that I I actually yeah that that. that one of these guys transferring over to SMU, or uh, transferring over to TCU, excuse me, I think would be the dream scenario, one hundred percent, and it would finally get me, give me a reason to put Quentin Johnson higher in my rankings because I still haven't been able to get him above like Q, wide receiver twenty five. I don't think because I just I'm not going to put him high until I know who that QB bo- is throwing to him, and I would love yeah. I would love either one of these guys. <laughs> What's interesting is that Sonny Dykes has also alluded to the fact that um, he's going to wait till after the spring and reassess the need. He's, he's openly said, if we need a QB after the spring, we will absolutely go get one. He said that there's, he's just going to have to wait and see how other uh, battles shape up throughout the rest of the country and that mm-hmm. guys are going to be available. So, I mean, he's, he's, almost, he's almost basically sent that message over to Mordecai. Hey, if it doesn't work out for you there, you got a home here kind of deal. I, I, honestly, I would say it would go for either one because again, like, like right. Stone and Lashley have a good relationship, but I have a feeling Stone and Dykes have a pretty good relationship as well. I tried to I tried to look it up to see. So this Mordecai has been in school for four years now. The key is Mordecai has to, similar to JT Daniels, transferring a second time, he has to be a grad transfer. So yes. he has to have completed his his undergrad academics. I I couldn't confirm if he's technically a grad student now. I would assume he's probably after the spring, at least he probably will have enough credits because that's four years. Yes. Um, but, he, but in order for him to be now stone can transfer and play immediately because yes. he hasn't transferred before, but Mordecai will need to be a, a grad transfer. Honestly, stone would be like stone going over to Sonny Dyke's system and him sitting there for three years, I think would be a dream scenario for any owner of him in CDC or dynasty. Absolutely. Alrighty, so kind of broke that one down. Let's go ahead and touch on our third QB battle that we're going to touch on here. And that is kind of, you're going to hear me say what team we're about to talk about. You're going to sit there and think, huh? Of all the schools to discuss the battle at? We're going to talk about West Virginia. And there is three legitimate options that Nate and I were kind of talking about here in terms of who could end up taking this job by the fall. We have Garrett Green, who was the backup last year behind Jared Dougie. Jared Dougie off to Western Kentucky. And then you had Will Crowder, a three-star freshman quarterback coming in last year, played a couple of snaps for them. And then this year you have four-star quarterback Nico uh Marquio I th- Marquio yeah Marquio? that's right okay perfect um Nico Marquio coming in as a true freshman now again you're at, probably sitting there asking me like all right Jared who cares it's West Western Kentucky Jared Dougie was like I don't know like a hundred and something in terms of CFF QB last year well my friends uh the offensive coordinator Graham Harrell, formerly of Southern California, with Lincoln Riley there now, has moved on, and he is now the offensive coordinator at West Virginia. So, Nate, why don't you go ahead and break down some of these guys and tell me why or like who, like what are the pros and cons of each one? Which one do you think could run the former USC offense here at West West Virginia? Yeah, so what's interesting is I kept thinking that West Virginia was going to be a transfer landing spot throughout all this, uh, you know, all these moving pieces within the portal. And, and I read into it and both Harold and Neil Brown had said that they didn't add a transfer because they want to get full reps over the course of the spring to the three inexperienced guys here to see exactly what they had. Uh, they said their plan is to either one name one of them in the spring as the guy, or at least narrow it down to two. And that if they aren't impressed with what they are seeing, then they will pursue somebody after the spring practices, which is really, really valuable information. Cause you know, 
they're either going to name a guy or you're going to have a pretty good idea who it is. Or if they don't name a guy and they bring somebody in in the spring, you can confidently state that guy's getting the job. Like yes. otherwise they weren't going to be pursuing him. So um, that's really valuable info. Garrett Green's interesting. So he was the backup last year. Yes. He is uber athletic. Um, didn't throw the ball a whole lot. They kind of limited his, uh, his playbook, but um, they had him in for a lot of running plays and he, and he was very successful running the ball last year. I'd say 48 um, rushing attempts compared to 26 passing attempts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he's athletic enough to where there are some rumors that if he doesn't win the job, um, we could see a position change. Maybe he moves out to wide receiver. Ooh. So, um, which is interesting. West Virginia's had some success with that in the uh, in the past. They had that uh, wide receiver that played under um, Dana Holgerson, who was a former quarterback that ended up putting up some monster numbers there. But um, so that's something just to kind of watch for. He's probably the least, um, I would say, prolific passer of the three. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know much about Will Crowder, to be honest with you. He's kind of the odd man out here in my mind. Like he's kind of slipped through the cracks. I'll keep an eye on him if if we start to hear some rumblings that he's in that mix to be one of the final two guys. Um, hopefully we we get some info in spring practice, but I'm just kind of monitoring his situation. I really think it's between Green and uh and Markiel who's coming in. He was the Arizona, Markiel was the Arizona um player of the year in high school last year. Uh He's a four-star QB. He's a lefty. Um, he can spin it pretty good. Um, compact, quick release. Harold said that kind of the main thing he's looking for in a QB, the, the primary thing is accuracy, being able to hit targets. And Markiel kind of fits that um, more than probably the other two do. He's got decent mobility, 6'2", 215, can run it okay. Um, so I, I think he kind of fits the mold of what Harold's looking for. It's just going to be a case of how quickly can he pick up the system. So, I mean, he'll be there in the spring. So uh, he's got an opportunity to my, my guess is um, I think they'll give the nod to green. Um, and then, but I, I think Mark, Hill could really push him. It, Harold's never really had a good offensive line and green's escapability, ability to make plays, uh, off script and that type of thing could actually benefit him here. And I, I went back and watched some of the spring game from last year. Oh, and poor and <laughs> Garrett Green actually looked, he looked pretty decent throwing the ball. Um, so yeah, he's, he's got really sneaky upside. I think if you, I, I took him really late in uh, a best ball draft. Um, it's just, man, the combination of a Graham Harrell air raid offense with a guy that uh, has some decent wheels too. I mean, that's, that's a really nice mix for, for a high level fantasy upside. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, we've, again, I literally wrote down, like, to me, this is one of the best possibilities of a true freshman starting in a high prolific CFF relevant offense with the Graham Heller offense that I think we have in this country. Like if you're a CFF dynasty guy, like, this like Markio is going to go much higher in a CFF dynasty than I think he'll go in like a C to C because you could have a three year mm-hmm. starter, which you don't typically get in a high prolific offense for CFF dynasty. Um, and we've seen Graham Harrell not really have much of a problem in terms of playing true freshmen in the past, whether you're looking at JT Daniels, uh, Keaton Slovis, like these are guys. Oh, actually, no, scratch JT Daniels. He came in JT Daniels a sophomore year, but even still. Keaton Slovis. As soon as JT Daniels got hurt, he immediately threw out Keaton Slovis and did pretty good things with him that first year. Obviously, things kind of fell off over the next two years and everything. Um, but even still, like he's not afraid to throw a young guy out there. So with that being said, like that, with that being the um, kind of the blueprint of what we've seen in the past, I'm kind of with you where you can probably see Green take over as that starting or as the starter week one. But if he struggles in the game, actually, because again, you, you're right. In the spring game, he looked a lot better passing the ball than he had outside of it. But there are plenty of guys who look good in practice or look good in scripted scenarios against your own guys. But as soon as you're put out there on the field, all of a sudden they look like deer in the headlights. I think you could probably see Markiel get some action pretty early in this system. So honestly, I might almost... Hmm... 
I don't know. I, I scratched that last part. I'm not going to say that. I would I would agree with you that Green offers the most upside with his rushing ability. If he can hold on to that job, he's going to be an excellent excellent pickup on the waiver wires in those weeks one and two. I was uh, I was just looking at it because I was curious what their uh, non conference looks like. They actually played Pitt week one, which is really interesting. Uh, so that kind of puts a little bit of pressure on Harrell and Brown to pick their guy early because you got a, a legit non con game right out the right out the gates. To piggyback on what you were saying, as far as uh, Harold not being afraid to play the young guy, uh, you'd mentioned how slow this came in for JT Daniels. And then we saw Dart actually come in as a true freshman true. Uh, for Slovis. But what's interesting is, is uh, the pattern there is that his starting QB keeps getting hurt. It happened to JT Daniels. It happened to Slovis. Uh, and in fact, uh, Dart ended up injured last year as well, too his offensive lines have been bad. He constantly has QBs getting hurt. Um, mm-hmm. For some reason, he just cannot uh, sustain a healthy uh, starting quarterback. So it's it's just kind of interesting pattern there. How many guys from West Virginia's offensive line are coming back? Do we know that off the top of our heads? I, I haven't I haven't looked at it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Because if they can bring back what they had last year for Letty Brown and everything, right. like, hopefully, that, hopefully that'll be a little bit better than what you're getting at USC. But honestly, that's a little... <laughs> damning as to what usc had if west virginia has a better o-line than you did right all right so we've discussed three qb battles we went with um we went with the liberty qb room smu qb room just finished with western virginia room let's move on to some running back rooms that we could really dive into here first one we're going to talk about is the mizzou running back room why well if you own Ty- tyler Beatty last year you know exactly why that this room is so prolific tyler Beatty, the rb2 of last year would have been the rb1 had Brees hall not had an absolute monster game to finish the season uh went 268 attempts for 1604 yards and 14 touchdowns on the ground through the air he had 54 receptions 330 yards and four touchdowns so now the question is can that be replicated with one person and really it boils down in my opinion to two guys one of which was already on the roster last year and elijah young uh he had 37 attempts on the ground for 162 yards and touchdowns but 11 receptions for 64 yards and a touchdown versus a transfer from stanford nathaniel pete coming in with an experience last year of 79 rushing attempts, 404 yards, and three touchdowns, along with 11 receptions for 63 yards and zero touchdowns. So both of these guys are coming in. Pete, to me, has the more experience. Young is the younger guy, and but he's also been there at Mizzou. He knows the system pretty well that Eli Drake-Wins has been trying to set up. What do we think about these two guys, Nate? Like, uh, It looks like, I mean... Pete was the one who got up to 400 yards last year, has a little bit more experience there on the ground. Could we see a, again, could we unfortunately see a um, a split backfield between these two? What are you kind of thinking here? I don't think we do. The The beauty of a, of a Eli Drinkwitz system, his offense is that running backs don't split carries. You just mentioned uh, just how many touches Tyler Beatty got last year, Three, 322 total touches between uh, running and, and receiving if you just go back and look at the track record uh, of Eli Drinkowitz, uh, just the last three that he's had as a head coach, Roundtree, Beatty, and then Evans over at App State, uh, 322 touches, 224 touches, 276 touches. We saw the same thing whenever he was the OC at, uh, at NC State uh, with Hines. His running backs produce – And he has no interest in a running back by committee, which is the total opposite of somebody we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But um, I'd mentioned Pete in as a guy that I highlighted in my stock up report, just simply because he, you know, I mean, we, we waited all off season to try to find out who Missouri was going to bring in the portal. It just seemed like a perfect landing spot. And uh, Pete ended up being that guy. He's kind of a, Tyler Beatty light, I guess you could say he's, he's five, nine, one eighty ish. And that, that may be, you know, on a good day for him. Um, but he, he, he hasn't proven and, and Beatty hadn't either until he, until he ran with that job, but Pete hasn't proven that he can handle 20 plus touches a game. I mean, he was, he was Stanford's leading rusher last year, but really by default that Stanford just couldn't run the ball last year. And, and Pete broke off a couple long runs, but 
he's fast. He catches the ball really well. He's definitely going to play special teams. So uh, interestingly enough, he's actually from Columbia, uh, Missouri, originally, where nice. he grew up. He grew up right down the street from Mizzou. So um, Elijah Young is probably the main competition. Uh, he didn't get hardly any run last year because of Beatty, but he did. He did get the bulk of the carries whenever Beatty sat out the bowl game. So we know that he's at least in that next man up um, scenario. My, my guess is, is that I would give a slight edge to Pete. I think there's a reason why they brought him in. Uh, and I think he does fit. Uh, Drinkowitz loves to, to throw the ball to the running back. And he's got, he, he was a wide receiver in high school. Pete was. So um, I, I, and practice reports have been good on him so far. Interestingly enough is that the, the, the value uh, or the, the draft capital between the gap between these two is huge. Um, Pete's been going in the first seven or eight rounds of some of the best balls I've been in. Meanwhile, Elijah Young, you can get after the 25th, you know, 20, let me see here. Um, I was getting him like in around 25, 26. So um, we'll know more after the spring, but um, probably a slight edge to Pete right now, but a huge value difference. Yeah. I'm looking it up right now. They're actually a lot closer in, um, they're a lot closer in the uh, redrafts that I've been uh, redraft mock drafts I've been doing. Uh, Nathaniel Pete is currently going as the RB fifty, usually in that kind of round uh, like eleven or no, excuse me, uh, round nine tennis range. And Elijah Young is usually one of the last ones taken off the board, and he is sitting there right at about round fifteen ish in terms of his, okay in terms of his ADP. So about a, about a five six round difference, pretty pretty decent size, but everything, but. Sounds like it's a little bit closer than what you're seeing in the uh, best ball drafts. Uh, if y'all can hear my cat, please ignore her. She is a very, yeah. very loud. By the way, new cat, everybody. Uh, this is uh, it, Fiona is currently saying hi, if you can hear. Anyway. Fiona has strong opinions on the Missouri running back situation. Yes, she certain, certainly, certainly does. Um, so you're putting your you're putting your um, eggs in the basket with Pete. I'm gonna agree with you again. Haven't had too much agreement so far, or too much disagreement here with where we're kind of leaning with some of these guys, and we can see that in the draft capital. A lot of people kind of lean in the same ways that we are. I'm thinking it's gonna be Pete, but if you have Elijah Young on your dynasty roster or your C to C roster and everything, hold on to him. Um, just hold on to him because I guarantee you, Pete, as a junior this year. Um, I think he's a junior this year. I think he's a redshirt junior. Um, junior this year goes out there. RB1 for Mizzou probably goes off the draft. Elijah Young very much then the next guy up, probably in my opinion. Um, I doubt that he is, or I, I doubt they keep him down forever. Because, he, again, we, he's shown that he can handle that workload for the most part um, in the Mizzou offense. So we will we will see. All right. Let's go talk about, let's go a little closer to home for you, Nate. Let's talk about the Oklahoma running back battle. And typically we've kept it between two and three guys for like where the battles are. I got four guys written down for this one. And we got Eric Gray, uh, the second highest rushing leader from last year behind Kennedy Brooks. Kennedy Brooks obviously ended up taking the job by the throat and just going off for a monster 1,200 yards and 13 touchdowns. But Eric Gray comes back. Uh, Marcus Major, uh, who's been on the OU roster for a couple years now, in my opinion, has kind of been very quiet for the most part. But then, in addition to those two, you have a duo of freshman running backs coming in in Gavin Sawchuk and Javante Barnes. So, Nate, you are the OU guy. You have a lot of connections with that program and everything. Why don't you tell me, like, kind of what are you hearing? Like, what, what, what can we expect here? And then we'll kind of get into what we've seen from a Jeff Levy offense in the past. Yeah, so on paper, you would think, just looking at this situation, okay, Brooks moves on. Gray was the number two. Gray's going to fill into that role. He's going to now start to get a heavy, um, a heavy dose of Eric Gray. I, I don't necessarily think it plays out quite like that. Um, I do think Marcus Major is going to play a pretty big role here. Um, what's interesting about Gray is that he looked fantastic in the spring game last year. Mm-hmm. He he obviously was very productive during his couple of years at Tennessee. 
And he was actually the starter. I mean, he was the guy for the first couple of games of the season last year. And then Lincoln Riley got a really good look at just how poor a vision Eric Gray has in, in reading uh, holes. And it, it was, I mean, it was awful. And it got to the point where uh, he really just became a change of, change of pace back for, for Lincoln last year. And Brooks just got fed heavily because Brooks is the exact opposite. He has, he's got terrific vision. Um, what's interesting between the two freshmen that you mentioned is that a lot of people think that Sawchuck might be the guy. Uh, he's the higher rated back of the two. That's not at all what I am, what I'm hearing, what I'm reading from a lot of the OU insiders. Uh, the staff loves Barnes. Apparently he's just been a freak show in a lot of the uh, off season workouts. Uh, Gavin Sawchuck isn't arriving until the summer. So Barnes has already got a leg up there. Um, and apparently Barnes was the primary guy that running backs coach DeMarco Murray and OC Jeff Levy wanted as they uh, pursued uh, their running back recruits um, in December. So um, it, it looks like maybe we could be seeing all three of those guys, Gray, Major, and Barnes, playing a role. And if you, what's interesting is if you look back at Ole Miss last year where Levy was at, they kind of fit really well with what Ole Miss says. If you say, okay, Eric Gray is Jerry on Ely. And, yeah. I was just uh, you know, he, he's, he's the versatile one that can catch the ball out of the backfield, really good in space. Marcus Major is kind of the bruiser, like a Snoop Connor. And then uh, Javante Barnes is the, the fresh, you know, the young guy that comes in, spells those two, kind of uh, a good all-round back, um, you know. So they, they kind of really fills in with what, with what they did, but you and I talked about it before we even hopped on the show here. Levy loves a committee. He mm -hmm. really, really does. Um, four guys, including Matt Corral had over a hundred carries last year. If you go back and look at his, his two years at Ole Miss, the one year he had calling plays at UCF, you just see that he, he spreads the ball around a lot. And usually his primary guy is the guy that can really catch the ball out of the backfield, which is good for Eric Gray. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw the same thing with Jerry on Ely, Otis Anderson over at UCF. But um, I, I think we're looking at a committee here but for sure. I mean, it's just, we have to go off the track record. Track record says there's going to be a committee. I've written down from the past like three years of with where Jeff Flavi has been an offense, including Ole Miss and UCF. They're the highest rushing total a, a running back has ever produced was last year with Jerry and Ely for 768 yards. And he wasn't even the guy that got the most touchdowns. So even if you're looking at him for fantasy, it was a big disappointment in fantasy last year because, yeah, he was a leading rusher, but he only got five touchdowns versus Snoop Connor, who got 13, and Matt Corral, who got 11. So it's, like you're, it's, not even a, it's not even like he finds one guy that he just hands the ball off to on the goal line over and over and over again. Um. So you can't even base it off of that. And I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with you. Like, I was big on Eric Gray kind of coming into the season. I'm like, oh, yeah, like, I'd love to see what Eric Gray can do in a Jeff Levy offense. It's like, I think you mentioned it before, like, Levy constantly has, like, a top 10, top 5 rushing offense. Problem is, he just hands it off to so many different guys that it, you can't get any real value out of it. Now, I, I will ask, and I hate to think this way because, again, I don't root for injuries, but I do wonder if... Maybe a guy or two goes down to injury and everything. Maybe then you start seeing somebody kind of come out from the pack. But even still, like you don't, you don't, you shouldn't rely on injuries in, in any kind of fantasy whatsoever. And even still, like that's when you just go and spend all your fab money, or you make sure you get them off the waiver wire and stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's what's interesting too with Levy's offense is that if you look at Ole Miss last year, there was almost seventy balls caught by. Uh, running backs. Yes. Um, and we saw some of that at UCF as well. And like I said, I think that favors Eric Gray. He's, he's the one that's proven to be a really nice pass catcher as a running back. We major and Barnes haven't proven that yet. So I was about to I think ask that, if you'd heard anything about Barnes and his catching ability. I think he, he had limited experience with it in high school, but the word is, is that all signs point that he's got the ability to. It's okay. just I don't think that was their system as much. But he 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 is a he's a well-rounded back. He doesn't do anything particularly great, but he doesn't have really any holes. Honestly, so, all that he needs. 
Right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. He, he really, he really kind of is that Henry Parrish type of the bunch that can just kind of come in there and, and do play any down. So uh, yeah, I could definitely see major picking up a lot of the goal line red zone carries um, gray working between the twenties and, and Barnes kind of, you know, getting just a handful of carries early on, but then all of a sudden towards the end of the year, you could see Barnes maybe pushing for eight to 10 carries a game. I mean, we're talking about an offensive system that, that, I mean, they rushed it close to 45 times a game last year. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of carries to go around, but I just, I don't think you're going to see a, a top 10 running back out of this group. I, I mean, I'll, I'll be real. I don't think you're going to see a, I mean, Kennedy Brooks, even with his um, monster year last year, finished as the RB46. Right. So, like, you're definitely not going to – and I, I think I double-checked. I think Ely was outside the top 100, and I believe uh, Stu Connor also outside the top 100 because they just weren't getting the yards and the touchdowns that they needed to break into those top tiers. So unfortunately, as much as the OU running back room has been a – staple of cff the past couple of years i just don't think we're going to be I, I agree with you i don't really see anybody we're getting out of this group here soon now again javante barnes i will probably be targeting him in dynasty because i could see him getting a much bigger and bigger role as each year goes on but we'll see we never really got that with ely so who knows mm-hmm. all right let's go from down in the midwest or uh is Oklahoma Midwest? Do we call Oklahoma Midwest? I call it Midwest. Some people okay. say South. Some people say South. Some people say Southwest. True. It, it is right on that border of a whole bunch of different regions. Anyway, let's go up north. Uh, let's go to Michigan. We're going we're gonna to talk about uh, Blake Corum versus Donovan Edwards. One of the more, in my opinion, kind of clear cut RB battles. Like, there's no like dark horse in my opinion here. You got Blake Corum who really was the number two last year behind Haskins, got dinged up, really kind of fell behind Haskins as the year kind of went on. But even still, he had 144 attempts for 952 yards and 11 touchdowns, as well as 24 receptions for 141 yards and a touchdown. But then you have the young guy, Donovan Edwards, a borderline five-star. I think 247 actually had him rated as a five-star, but the composite had him at a four-star. Even still, young guy coming in last year, Six foot, 202 pounds, had 35 rushing attempts for uh, 174 yards and three touchdowns last year, as well as 20 receptions for 265 yards and a touchdown. So obviously the backdrop here, Hassan Haskins going off to the NFL and vacating almost 270 carries that can then be split between, probably going to be split between these two guys. But Nate, is there a possibility that we see one of these two guys kind of break away and become the clear one rather than a 1A, 1B combo? I don't think so. I I think we have a a situation here where they're going to split. And it's a situation where we saw last year before Corum got hurt, where he was splitting time with Haskins. Both of them can still be highly, highly productive. Um, now, obviously, they've they've had some changes on offense with Gaddis taking the Miami job. We'll see kind of what changes, how those changes play out. But Corum was fantastic before his ankle injury last year. He was averaging 23 points per game fantasy-wise while sharing the backfield. Um, and, and you could probably argue at that point when he went down, he was the one to own over Haskins. Haskins really kind of shot off like a rocket ship after – Corum went down. got hurt. So, uh, yeah, I was actually going to tweet about that. I'll probably tweet about it later today about what, what, what would things be, what would things look like had uh, Corum never went down? Because we would have never seen Donovan Edwards go off against Maryland where he had 10 catches on 11 targets for 170 yards receiving and a touchdown. Mm-hmm. We, we would have never seen that with, <clears throat> with, with Corum healthy. Um. A lot. I know that uh, what's interesting, I don't know where they're going as far as with um, your ADP and some of the mocks. I know that in some of the best balls, at least a couple that I've been a part of, they're both going to kind of go in right in that five to six, five to seven round range. Uh, Quorum goes first and then Haskin, or I'm sorry, uh, Edwards goes right after him. So, so there's this bigger split and redraft between the two. I figured there probably would be. So Corum is to be taken as the RB21. And if I just do some quick math real quick, that's pretty much right at the end of round four, 
beginning of round five. Then Edwards is being taken as the RB33, and he's okay. being taken around like middle of round seven, eight. Okay, so a couple few rounds difference there, but still yeah. overall value wise, they're they're pretty close, all things considered. A little bit of a little bit of an edge to quorum there. Um, what's interesting is in, in our best ball drafts, I know that Mike Bainbridge, who's he's who, real big know, on so, Edwards. So yeah, he's somebody that I trust when it comes to Michigan football. And he is he is big on Edwards. And clearly a lot of the um Debbie guys are really high on Edwards, given his uh his pedigree, the fact that he's got a little bit more size, Quorum's kind of maxed out at that five nine, one ninety-five-ish range. So the, the NFL upside may be kind of limited for him. So mm-hmm. But, you know, the more I dug into some of Edwards' numbers last year, yeah, I mean, he had the big game against Maryland. But if you look at his rushing numbers, so he had 174 yards. 58 of that came on one carry. So he averaged in, in, in his other 34, he had 35 carries last year. If you look at his other 34 carries, he averaged 3.4 yards per rush. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I don't really get too bogged down in, in yards per carry. That's not the main thing I look at in a running back. But I find that – I find that interesting. That means he's he's probably got a little ways to go as far as learning the system, learning to be patient, getting that vision. Um, I, I I would give the edge to Corum. Um, I just think he's proven he's got some pretty elite burst. But what's interesting is that neither one of these fit the Haskins mold. Haskins leaves. Neither one of them is kind of that big goal line bruiser that's going to get you in there that's the part i was about to bring up there is the one number i'm going to really keep an eye on with edwards throughout the offseason is his weight yeah i think quorum is kind of maxed out he's been there long enough to where he would have if he was going to put on weight he would have put on weight by now edwards is entering only his second year there and now he's a full offseason to really be a part of that nutrition uh, or nutritional program that michigan would want him to be a part of and if they do see him as being that complement to Corum, maybe a bigger body back. Maybe they put some weight on him. If he can get upwards of like 210, 215 pounds, and he can keep that receiving ability, I'm with you in that Corum currently, I think has the better value because of just the experience he's had in the system. But if Edwards can put on just a little bit of weight and keep that receiving ability that he's already been able to show, I'm going to start leaning towards Edwards, and I'm going to start believing Mike Bainbridge on this. And I think this might be the first time where you and I kind of disagree a little bit. Again, granted, mine's based off of a, a if scenario, but if Edwards can put on like 10, um, 10, 13 pounds and stuff like that, I fully can believe in the upside of Donovan Edwards at that point where you're a bigger body back, but you also have a better receiving upside than Haskins ever had last year. I think that's a great point. We know what Corum is. We know exactly what he can be he, he's kind of shown that and he's got his limitations he's never going to be the the every down carry you 25 times a game kind of yes. guy edwards has that upside quorum lacks that so yeah even though i would give an edge to, to quorum right now there clearly edwards probably has the ceiling that quorum can't reach absolutely all righty that's enough of running backs. We talked about Mizzou. We talked about Oklahoma. We talked about Michigan. Let's talk about some of these wide receiver rooms. And by far, by far, the one that people request us to talk about the most is the Alabama receiving room. And why not just look at what they've been able to produce these past couple of years with their top receivers? Look at Jamison Williams, Devontae Smith having a Heisman season. Look at... Jalen Waddle, before he went down with injury, he was on pace to have a absolutely monster season. Devontae Smith, the year before that, was having a monster season, along with Jerry Judy, Henry Ruggs, all these guys. They they have been an absolute factory. So now the question is, with Jamison Williams and John Mechie, 2,000-yard receivers, off to the NFL, who steps up? To me, four candidates here that have a chance, one of whom I think is behind the other three, but we'll kind of get into that. We got Ajay Hall, Ja'Cory Brooks, JoJo Earl, and Jermaine Burton. If you followed me at all, you have known I have firmly, firmly planted my flag on two of these guys. One is Jermaine Burton. I think he absolutely takes over that X role, or that the, the role that Jamison Williams and Devontae Smith have had the past couple years 
Just a smaller, speedier guy that can easily take the top off of a defense. I think he's going to absolutely take over for that this year. I think he will be the number one wide receiver for Bama. But I'm also putting my flag on JoJo Earl, mostly to do to the fact that I think he has locked up that slot role going forward. I think his early work on special teams shows that Saban wants him out there on the field as much as he can. And so I think JoJo Earl has locked up the slot role going forward, and he's going to be peppered with targets in that slot role. So I would say he's a bit more value in a PPR league than maybe a typical standard league. But even so, I expect him just to be out there more than uh, pretty much all these other guys because I could see the other two guys, Ja'Cory Brooks and Ajay Hall, probably rotating a little bit. But even so, I'm going to plant my flag that Ja'Cory Brooks will be the third wide receiver. I think Ajay Hall, likely we see him transfer. Um, just based off, um, just based off like behind the scenes stuff and everything I've heard where he's very much one of these receivers where he's just not happy with not getting on the field. And if he goes another, if he goes an entire off season where it becomes very clear that he's behind Burton, Earl and Brooks and he has, and, and he felt, and he feels like he's put in the work to do so. I don't see a way that he stays on Bama's, uh, Bama's roster all the way to the fall. What do you think, Nate? What do you think about these four guys? Who are you planting your flag on here? Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting how much I think I agree with you on this. I don't know if maybe it's just been some of our Slack conversations that we've had and, and discussing, um, you know, this group, but I'm with you. I actually think for me and my rankings, I think there might be a bigger gap um, between Earl as the number two and the number three, whoever that may be at Bama, than I do uh Burton kind of being on his own as the number one I actually I, I group Earl closer to Burton than I do to Corey Brooks or Ajayi Hall um what's you know why this is such a crucial thing to figure out is that the average stat line for the Bama wide receiver one over the last four years is 83 receptions 1500 yards 17 touchdowns yep. I mean that's just that's stupid that's yeah. that right there is a top five uh, wide receiver every year. And that's the ravage. Obviously, Devontae Smith has kind of skewed some of that because his season was such a monster year. But I mean, and, and they've proven even last year that they can have multiple 1,000 yard wide receivers. So I'm with you. Jojo Earl uh, has locked up the slot. So I give him, I, I think he's going to lock up the slot. So I'll give him a little bit of a bump because of that. I think Burton's the number one guy there. Um, I am a little concerned, and, and I'll ask you this because you're the Georgia guy. I'm a little concerned that um, he has a history of not being able to stay totally healthy. He couldn't really separate from what I would say is mostly mediocre, unproven wide receiver group at at Georgia. You know, I mean, obviously Pickens was great, but still, yeah. like, um, you know, I don't – do you think that that, that that factors in at all here? Does that worry you at all as being the clear number one there? The injury thing, I mean, I, again, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not entirely sure how much of the, the injuries that he's had in the past have mostly been nagging injuries. They haven't, like, never has he really been taken out of a season in order to heal from an injury. It's mostly just kind of been week-by-week week stuff for the most part, so I guess that's a little concerning. In right. terms of not being able to separate... Again, it pains me to say as a Georgia fan, but it's the system at Georgia. I have heard so many practice reports from about Jermaine Burton where he has been described as, quote, making our DBs look silly. And as again, if you know anything about the Georgia defensive backfield, like there are in some incredibly, incredibly talented um, players there right now and this was back as well when eric stokes and tyson campbell were our top two corners and those are two guys one of which went in the first round of the nfl draft last year the other one was the first one taken in the second round and i have been told that jermaine burton just made those guys look silly made guys like darion kendrick lewis seen chris smith all those guys he made them look silly in practice and so to me it was a crime that georgia wasn't making it a bigger focus to make sure that he got the ball more often than he did granted some of it again some of it was him being in and out of games for the most part of the season but even still when he was on the field i wish he just gotten just a little bit more love he's going to get the love at bama uh they have shown that they can produce that 
he is absolutely going to destroy it, Bama, and I am very convinced that he will be the clear number one wide receiver. As much as I love Earl, I think Burton is going to be the guy. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's I think there's also a point where Nick Nick Saban's trying to prove here, similar to what he did with Jace, uh, Jameson Williams last year, where he's going to make an effort to make Burton the guy. That way he can continue to sell yes. to the top wide receivers or the top running backs, whatever. Hey, I know you're, you're great on your team. Now, do you want to get drafted in the first round? Come here, because that's what I'm going to do for you. And he's smart so, about it too, where he's also making sure that it's one of his recruits as well that's getting the love as well. Because like last year right. he had John Mechie. So it can't be all of a sudden where it's like, oh, I'm a recruit. Like, right. why would I come to Bama? You're just going to bring in a transfer guy, portal guy over me. It's like, well, we've had a transfer and one of our guys be the top guys every single year. So there's still a path for you through that. Yeah, totally agree. Um, back to, to Earl for just a second. He's been in some of the best balls I've been in. He's He's been kind of going in that 9 to 11 round range, and I'm I'm totally cool with that. You took him in one. I, I took him in the first one. Um, I'm I'm totally good with that. Jai Hall and Ja'Cory Brooks are going in the same range. That I'm that I'm no, not comfortable I'm with. Brooks, that's Brooks a that's too. Times. That, that's that's too, I, I'm not comfortable really with either one of them uh, going in the same range. Is I, I would much rather have JoJo Earl over those other two. Oh, I, I misinterpreted I, you. So Brooks is going in the same range as Earl. Brooks, uh, yeah. So in some of the best balls we've been doing, Brooks and Ajayi Hall are all going kind of right in that round nine to twelve range. Uh, they're all kind of grouped in there together. There's very little separation in some of those best balls. Clearly, somebody's just taking their shot, uh, hoping that they get the wide receiver one or two for Bama. Yeah, but yeah, they're all kind of going together. And I would much rather in that range. I would much rather have Earl over the other two. Yeah, so I'm 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 looking in the redraft leagues real quick. I have the ADP pulled up, and this is actually interesting. So Hall's gone. Hall's not in the ADP so far. Nobody's drafted him in any of the redraft leagues we've done so far. But Jacory Brooks is actually being drafted right at the end of the fifth round, and Earl is being drafted as the wide receiver thirty nine down near just after like middle of the eighth round. Which right. that to me is a mistake. Earl needs like switch those ADPs, and I feel a little bit better about it. In fact, I put Brooks down even further. But even so, Brooks should not be going right. as high as he is right now. What I what I do find interesting with Brooks is that if you know if Burton were to um, be injured again yes. or not pan out as much as we we think that he has the ability to. I think Brooks potentially goes from the number three to the number one. Um, there's there's an opportunity yeah. with him being that other boundary wide receiver. He could be the one if Burton's hurt or if he disappoints. I don't think that's the case for Hall. There's just too much baggage with him. Yeah. So I, I think he's got too many hurdles to overcome, um, or I think it could happen with Brooks. I, I also want to keep an eye on Christian Leary because I think he's – I mean, he was a highly touted recruit. Um, I think he's he looks – like why wouldn't he hit the portal? He could be he could be a really nice player at, at another program right now. There's just too many to climb. Um, they they switched him over to running back last year when everybody was getting injured. So yeah. I know that there might be some talk about him maybe sticking there. We'll see. Hmm. The other thing I want to point out here real quick before we move on from the Alabama wide receiver room, I'll have to ask you. So Cameron Latou is another piece here that we need to keep an eye on. I think. Do we think he is a top, like top two receiver, maybe in this offense next year? No, I don't think so. Okay, um, I, I wouldn't go that far. I think he's a nice. I think he's a nice piece. Obviously, Billingsley uh, moving on helps him, but I mean, Billingsley was in the doghouse most of the year last year. Yeah. So I, I think I think what we saw from Latou last year is about what we can expect. Maybe maybe add twenty percent of his stats on top. In which case, he's a very nice tight end to pick up, in my opinion. He is, yeah, yeah. I think he's, I think he's a borderline top, top ten tight end. Um, but no, I, I don't think, I don't think that, um, you know, Bryce Young's the type that he can push the ball downfield. They don't need a safety valve to to be one of his main op, uh, options. That's true, but he was, he was kind of Bryce Young's safety valve once they got down there in the red zone, and Bill O'Brien asked him to pass three times in a row on the one yard yeah. line. So, <laughs> yeah, so. Even so, let's go ahead and move on to our second wide receiver room. 
I believe this is the first G5 school we're talking about here, but again, another one of these rooms where we gotta figure it out because Devin Tompkins was the wide receiver two last year. Just double checking myself. Yeah, that's right. No, I mean, top three. I don't top, know if he was two. De yeah, definitely top three. Look at hero. Oh uh, yeah, wide receiver three last year. So, and then the Blake. And again, once again, Utah is the Blake Anderson offense. Picking up, bringing it right over from Arkansas State. This is where it's at now. We have seen the wide receiver one for Blake Anderson's offense just go absolutely put up monster numbers in the past. Thinking guys like Devin Tompkins, thinking guys like Jonathan Adams Jr., thinking guys like Omar Bayless. Like it has become a must to figure out who that guy is going to be last year. In my opinion, that was a mistake on my part and a lot of people's last year, in that we didn't take more time to figure out who that would be last year with the Utah State wide receiver room. And a lot of people got a big time steal in Devin Tompkins, even though I know guys like um, Bainbridge and I think uh, who else was pushing Tompkins last year? Remember Nate? This guy right here. This guy right here. You're, you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're looking at <laughs> I would say me, me and uh, me and Justin Heisey and uh, Kyle Francis were probably, okay. I, I would say of, of like, I don't know, probably I played in probably nine leagues total between best balls and redrafts and dynasty. I, I think I owned uh, Tompkins was my highest owned wide receiver. I, I tried to scoop him up everywhere I could. I was yeah. really pissed. I was I was pretty pissed whenever he uh, decided he had one more year of eligibility left. I was yeah. like, surely this this little runt of a guy isn't going to go pro. And I'll this be damned. Small. He ended up. Going I, pro. I, I didn't really look up how big he was until <laughs> oh, later in the he's season. He's little. I was like, he's five foot eight, one hundred and fifty five pounds. Good lord. Yeah, he's a little guy. But anyway, we have three candidates here that I think me and Nate have kind of identified as like the top three choices to possibly take over that wide receiver one at Utah State this year. Xavier Williams, transfer from Alabama, former four-star coming over to Utah State. Brian Cobb, former three-star coming over from Maryland, had a very nice finish to the year before he entered the transfer portal. And then the one guy here who is directly from Utah State's offense last year, Justin McGriff, absolute mammoth of a human being, like six foot six, uh, 215 pounds. That is a massive, massive receiver. Um, but even still, between Tompkins, Brandon Bowling, and uh, Derek Wright, there are 206 receptions now open in this offense. Nate, which, again, what are the ups and downs of each one of these guys, and who are you personally targeting in your leagues? Before I jump into that, you know what I just noticed with this graphic that you put up here is that Xavier Williams, we talked about Bama transfer. And yes. we, you know, we were just talking about guys that could leave Bama because they're just so stacked. Uh, Cobbs comes from Maryland and McGriff actually is a transfer from Nebraska. Originally, all three of these guys we're talking about are oh, nice. Uh, are G5 or P5 to G5 transfers here. So um to, to get back on point, Xavier Williams is a guy that I highlighted in the stock up report. Um, he's, you know, he was a four-star recruit. There's, there's a pedigree there. There's a level of excitement that there has to be just because of his, um, his scouting profile. I mean, his, his recruiting profile. So that it, it is interesting, but the, the gap between him and Cobbs and McGriff just uh, has been interesting to me. I just did not expect that he would be going as early as he was. Whenever I put that stock up report, I, I was essentially thinking he would be kind of a late round flyer type guy. Uh, but clearly we, a lot of the industry has adjusted to just how successful Blake Anderson is with wide receivers and, and rightfully so. Um, you know, I think, Based on value, just because you, in, at least in all, once again, I'll refer to the best ball leagues. You can correct me as far as ADP that you're seeing with your mocks. But I mean, Xavier Williams is going in that kind of round nine to 10 range. Cobbs, and I tweeted about this too. Cobbs is kind of going in the uh, 12 to 14 range. And McGriff, I've been, I've, I scooped him up in two best ball drafts and I got him after round 25 both times. Yep. So um, I just think based off of that gap, uh, I like the value of McGriff the most. He was the guy that was there last year. He's familiar. Anderson's familiar with him. 
What's interesting is, and we, we talked about this pre-show, he doesn't fit the Blake Anderson mold as far as being a speed or a yak kind of guy. Mm-hmm. He's he's big. He's a little bit more lumbering. He's more of a red zone target. So I think both, I think we could see multiple, at least two guys here be very successful this season. Yes. Um, it's just kind of trying to figure out which one to take a flyer on. So out of these guys, I will not own any of Xavier Williams because I don't understand how we got to the point where we're so set on him being the number one guy here at Utah State, outside of the fact that he was a four-star and that he was at Bama. But let's talk about what he has done at Bama. You ready for his career stats at Bama? Mind you, he Sh- was, shouldn't take long. It's uh, he was at he w- he was from the class of 2018, so that's almost four years ago. Three catches. For 24 yards that my friends is a man that either has the most persistence in the world and was trying real hard or he's just not as good as advertised and he's trying to move down to a group of five team but i think we're almost going to fall a little bit into a trap here and get stuck on that a logo to me the value here, and again, I, I'm with you. I like McGriff. I'll scoop him up in round 25 plus all day long in some deeper leagues. But you're also correct, and we talk, again, we talked about this pre-show, that McGriff, because he's so large and because he's just not a big, fast guy, you, I honestly might be leaning more towards Brian Cobb, who is a bit more of the mold that we have seen with guys like Omar Bayless and Jonathan Adams Jr., where he's about six foot two, a little over six foot, 200 pounds, if he really can be that guy who can just provide a little bit of speed, hit some deep shots on him, which we sh- we saw from Maryland last year, I believe one of the games, I can't remember if it was a bowl game or one of the games late in the season, he got some deep balls thrown to him and he was able to do very, very well there. I think he might be the guy that I'm going to start planting my flag on just a little bit more. I think Justin McGriff is still going to have a very good time in this offense, probably get plenty of uh, 50-50 balls thrown his way, but I don't think he'll be that guy that take that can take the top off of a defense at any given point. So I'd probably hit him later. I think he deserves to go a little bit later, not round 25, especially if Xavier Williams is going round 10-ish. Um, but I think I'm going to go Brian Cobb here now, kind of like talking through this with you and everything today. He's kind of the guy that I'm starting to kind of feel like is probably the best candidate to take over that. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, It's, it's by all means an offense that you want to invest in from a wide receiver perspective, you want to get one of these three guys. It just comes down to, okay, which one can you get for the best value? Yeah. And again, currently that's Justin McGriff, but again, if I want the guy that I think is the, the best value but that fits that mold of the speedy guy, I'm going to go Brian Cobb. That's fair. So, we talked about the Bama wide receiver room. We've gone to G5. We're moving back up to Power 5. But we are <laughs> staying on the West Coast with our final position battle here. And we are going to talk about the USC wide receiver room. Man, oh man, do they got some options here. Uh, first of all, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, just know Kyle, Kyle Ford's face uh, will be haunting my nightmares tonight. Um... <laughs> But he was, I don't know. I don't know how well you can see it, Nate. But it's a. <laughs> it's a little small. It's a, it's pretty terrifying if you can watch this later. <laughs> anyway, um, but we got four good options here, and four I think all of which are worth discussing. We have the transfer coming over from Oklahoma, Mario Williams. We got Bryant, Gary Bryant Jr., who took really kind of took over after Drake London went down with injury last year, kind of became that number one guy. Kyle Ford. Um, Another highly recruited guy, still there, kind of started getting a bit more work as the season went on last year once he came back from injury. And then Taj Washington, former of uh, former Memphis Tigers fame, came to USC. I was a little hurt by that, but he got a very nice wide receiver two role here last year uh, behind Drake London, then later behind Gary Bryant Jr. So if they are going to pass a ton with Caleb Williams, if he keeps that wide receiver two role, could be some pretty good value there. Anyway, Nate... You're very familiar with Lincoln Riley's system and everything. Who should we be looking out for here? Who are the values here? Because again, pretty much Gary Bryant Jr. and Mario Williams are kind of going higher in drafts and the Taj Washington, Kyle Ford are kind of falling a little bit further. So what do you kind of feel in here? So 
I'm going to, I'm going to even add some more names to this. You've got these four guys up here, Mario, uh, Gary Bryant, Taj Washington, Kyle Ford. Let's also add in Brennan Rice transfers in from Colorado. Jerry yeah. Rice's kid, CJ Williams, big time, big time wide receiver recruit, uh, comes aboard. Terrell Bynum comes over from Washington. Who was one of their, I didn't, I didn't realize he went to USC. I missed that. Yep. Yep. Uh, he may have, he was either their leading or second leaving leading receiver last year. Uh, Please, Michael, Pete. Michael, Michael Jackson, the third, who a lot of the C2C guys like, and then let's, you know, let's just add in the fact that Relique Brown, let's face it, is not going to be a prototypical running back. He's going to be somebody that they're going to split out a lot of the times. And then let's add in, Hey, Travis die, Austin Jones, incredible pass catchers for running yep. backs. So they're going to, they're going to get looks out of the backfield as well, too. So in, in saying all that, basically what I'm, what I'm trying to convey here is, is that um, I certainly have my concerns just because there's, they're just, it's, a, it's an okay. example of too many, too many cooks in the kitchen here, number one. Um, so we have so many talented guys that are, that are trying to uh, make a name for themselves in this offense. I, I give an edge to Mario Williams just because there's a reason he followed Lincoln over here. Uh, he's got the familiarity with Caleb Williams. Um, so there, there's, there's gotta be some level of, of, you know, that you have to put on, on that. Yes. Um, it, but, but also if you just, if you dive a little deeper into, I know Lincoln's a fantastic, he's one, he's one of the top three offensive coordinators, if not the best offensive coordinator in the country. Um, but if you, if you really take a look, dive deep into the last couple of years for him, um, and, and his wide receiver production, they've not had a guy go for, I want to say over like 60, 63 catches, something like that. Um, yeah. haven't had an a thousand yard receiver. I mean, Marvin Mims was a stud his freshman year. He played less than half the, he played less than 50% of the snaps. Yep. Um, they've, they've, they've really focused a lot on, Hybrid type guys, H backs, tight ends, running backs out of the backfield. So yeah, I mean this is a this is a group where clearly Mario and and Gary Bryant are the ones going the highest. I don't think either one of those guys are going to return the value that people are investing mm -hmm. currently. Um, you can give the the ADPs, but I mean they're 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 going in the first ten rounds. I know. Um, I honestly, I, I don't hate the idea of taking a really late flyer on Taj Washington. I think the three starters are going to be Mario Williams, Gary Bryant Jr. and Taj Washington. So if you can get him at a much, much discounted price as compared to the other two, um, I don't hate that. And you and I will probably disagree because I know you're a little bit higher on some of the, the wide receiver options here than, than probably I am, but this honestly isn't a isn't a group that I'm I'm really looking to invest much in. I was a really big fan of Gary Bryant coming into this year, uh, mostly before Mario Williams got there. And, and and you're right, it's just getting to a point where there's too many cooks in the kitchen. And as as the room stands right now, I don't want to really have any of these guys. So my question then really kind of follows this: once we get out of spring, again, there's just so many options there. You have to have a feeling that somebody's going to transfer, right? Like you have a feeling like some, yeah, some of mean, these guys that haven't haven't used their transfer yet already, like right. I mean, I, I would say Kyle Ford would probably be the primary guy. I mean, Taj Washington's already transferred in. Yes. Mario Williams transferred in. Gary Bryant, you would assume, is going to lock up one of the top two to three spots. True. But I mean, the rest of the guys, Bynum. I mean, these are all Rice. These are all guys that literally should, they're, they're Riley just guy. Yeah. So I mean, maybe I, I could see Kyle Kyle Ford being a guy. What I, I what's his see, name? I could see Bryant being a surprise one, like a post spring surprise yeah. transfer. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah. That's that's fair. Um, I don't know. Maybe he goes to West Virginia, falls Graham Harrell. Oh my God, dude. I would actually kind of love that, especially <laughs> if they get the right quarterback there. Uh. Um, also, What's we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't mention this back with the West Virginia one, but like, isn't West Virginia, like with the way they, they were kind of talking about and like not going into the portal until after the spring, isn't that now a prime candidate for JC Daniels to transfer to? Yeah, we talked about it in our, and yeah. that's one that I suggested. And and when you and I were previously, uh, you had me on the pod. But yeah. yeah, I mean, you would you would think that if if they're waiting until after the spring, JT Daniels is waiting till after the spring. JT Daniels, albeit it was a short time with Graham Harrell, there is a relationship there. Yes. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, things look like they could align for that to be a possibility. Anyway, you were saying about the wide receiver room. You have one more point. 
Oh, what's the uh, what's the name of the guy? I think he's actually still there. The guy that got suspended. He bounced back and forth between. Oh Texas no, and McCoy USC. is in the transfer portal. Is he okay? Yeah, I was, McCoy I wasn't is in sure the transfer portal. What, Fantastic. If anybody belongs uh, in the transfer portal, it's it's definitely Brew McCoy. That guy is the epitome of the transfer portal. I think he's already been in there like six times. Yeah, he, he went from Texas to USC, and then I think he's uh, got. I, I think he's now graduated technically, so I think he's now just a journeyman. Effectively, I'm, I'm curious to see where he lands. Who takes a shot on him? I will be. I will be shocked if he has graduated college. <laughs> that, that would that would blow my mind. But good good for him if he has. Anyway, that pretty much wraps up our main rooms that we're going to talk about. I'm going to run through some kind of honorable mention rooms that we are going to keep an eye out, keep an eye out on. And then Nate, um, after I get through each position, if you just want to do like a 30 second blurb on any of them that really kind of sticks out to you, feel free. But anyway, QB battle, some other ones we're looking out for. We mentioned Texas Tech, we mentioned Clemson at the very beginning. Western Kentucky, that's going to be a big one, y'all. That is going to be a big one. They still have that offense from last year. At least they're going to try to replicate it. There's going to be some value there. Cincinnati QB room, Evan Prater, Ben Bryant, who's going to win that one? Washington QB room, Sam Hewitt and Michael Penix, who's going to be the face of the DeBoer offense there? Georgia Tech QB room, can Jeff Sims hold on to his job or can Zach Gibson take it over from him? And then USC QB room, you got Drake May versus Jacob Criswell. Who takes over there? Nate, anything um, there that you kind of want to do a blurb on any of these guys real quick? Um, I find the Cincinnati situation kind of unique in, in Bryant going back, yeah. transferring back to where he originally was that he transferred out of. You and I had uh, had had mentioned it. You guys transfer into these programs because you would think that they've been given some indication that they're, if not the starter, that they're going to be very much so in, in the competition. Absolutely. A lot of people have invested some some you know, quite a bit of value into um, quite a bit of stock into Evan Prater in dynasty leagues and that type yeah. of thing. So I, if you're an Evan Prater owner, you don't love the fact that they are bringing back a guy that um, was already there once before. So they have a new, uh, a new guy running the show now that their OC moved on to LSU. So that'll, that'll be an interesting competition there. Yeah, definitely. I would definitely say so. I, I, I view Bryant more as like almost like a safety valve where it's like, if Prater goes out there, because they have really nobody behind him. I mean, what do they got? Like Luchison coming mm-hmm. in this year as a freshman yeah. who I'm not entirely impressed with. So it's like it, Brian kind of provides like the safe floor if the bottom falls out on Prater for some reason. Yeah. So, yeah, that makes sense. That's how I kind of view it. Anyway, running back battle. Some other ones we're keeping an eye out on. We talked Missouri. We talked Oklahoma. We talked Michigan. BYU, Christopher Brooks versus Lapini Katoa. Both of those guys, I think either one of them, if they can win that job and take it by the reins, absolute value there right now michigan state y'all asked about that one a lot again just not a lot of information out there right now but jalen Berger versus jarek broussard uh y'all gonna be watching out for that one we talked usc wide receiver room but also the running back room there travis die and austin jones both of those guys absolutely as nate mentioned can be guys that are receiving options there we'll see the notre dame running back room logan diggs versus chris tyree what what kind of roles do we see there what do we see in a um I am blanking on the head coach of Notre Dame, Marcus Freeman. What does a Marcus Freeman offense look at? Like, we don't know yet. We don't know how they're going to be used yet. Cincinnati running back room. I can't believe people aren't talking about this. We just watched Jerome Ford be an absolute monster for them last year, and nobody, not going to transfer them. So, like, what's going on there? Ryan Montgomery, Charles McClellan, Ethan Wright. Somebody's got to step up there, hopefully. And then Arizona State, I've been back and forth with people on this one. Uh, Zazavian Valade versus Daniel Ngata. I'm on the Ngata train. Those are the other running back rooms I'm kind of keeping an eye out for. Nate, any of these you want to do a quick blurb on? Uh, I think you brought up a great point with Cincinnati having not got a transfer in yet. This seems like a a great situation where their staff, um, after the spring, once Jason McClellan gets a really good look at uh, Jameer Gibbs coming in, where their staff's like, hey, any Bama running backs want to come here? It worked out well for Jerome Ford. So. Yeah. Maybe Jason McClellan gives them a look. I don't know. It just seems like it just seems yeah, like keep, that's you a... keep bringing up like these scenarios that like are just like <laughs> making me feel like I'm in dreamland over here. <laughs> I, More, yeah, Mordecai I just, to TCU, McClellan to Cincy. Zero, zero fact base, um, total opinion stuff here. But yeah, we should that, do that a show like that one day where it's just like, hey, what like just dream scenarios rumors? transfers? <laughs> like, let's do it. Just and, do rumors all day long. 
Anyway, so let's go ahead and talk about a few of these wide receiver battles we're looking at here. Again, we talked to Alabama, we talked to Utah State, we talked to USC. West Kentucky, this was a very close one I was almost going to talk about. Again, very similar to Texas Tech and everything. Whoever's going to be the wide receiver one there is going to inherit the same kind of system that we saw at Western Kentucky last year. So hopefully, um, we got guys like Malachi Corley, Jaden Hall coming in from Western uh, Michigan, Josh Stearns coming in from last year, David, Her- David Davis, another guy from there last year, Michael Matheson coming in from Akron. A lot of different options there. Maybe we see a wide receiver by committee approach. We don't know. Nebraska, Nate, you kind of brought this one up a couple of weeks ago where the X receiver in a uh, Whipple offense is definitely going to be somebody we need to keep an eye out for. There, Omar Manning, Trey Palmer, two big guys that we're kind of looking at there, see if there's anything, if either one of them can really take the reins in that offense. Penn State wide receiver room. This one has been discussed by several of us experts in the past. Several of us have planned it on different guys. Parker Washington, Mitchell Tinsley, Keandre Lambert-Smith. Who becomes the wide receiver one there going forward? And then finally, again, touched on this a little bit earlier, but the SMU wide receiver room. Rushy Rice seems to be the number one guy, but we've seen in a Lashley offense in the past, the wide receiver two is still extremely valuable. So who takes over that? Is it Dylan Goffney? Is it Bo Corrales? Is it Joshua Moore? Is it another guy I haven't mentioned here? So those are the other ones we're kind of looking out for. Nate, any of those you want to touch on real quick? Yeah, you kind of hit on it with uh, with Nebraska. Um, I'm keeping an eye on who wins that that slot battle between Trey Palmer. Omar but that's Manning. an X receiver. I'm so bad. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. It's it's a really interesting battle. I mean, I I think Palmer fascinates me quite a bit in that he's got elite elite track speed, and um, Whipple likes to use kind of a, a a versatile piece, like a chess piece almost. That he can move mm-hmm. around to highlight his offense, a stretch slot kind of guy, uh, which Palmer would fit that well. And he's got familiarity with the wide receivers coach who came over from LSU to Nebraska. So, um, you know, and and if Omar Manning wins it, then that's kind of fascinating too, because he's like six, five, two thirty. He's massive. So it's, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, piece of the offense there. Yeah, so that pretty much wraps up our show and everything. Nate, again, thank you so much for coming on again. I know for the fact the listeners love whenever you can pop on here. So again, thank you so much for doing that. Again, y'all make sure you check out Nate's articles on the stock up, stock down from pre-spring and very much keep an eye out for when he does his follow-up post-spring. In addition, for us on the CFF side of things on the site, we are going to go heavy into these spring games in these next couple of weeks. We're going to be trying to keep up with all the spring news as much as we can condense it all bring it to you guys i know here on ctn i plan on starting having a segment at the beginning of every show similar to how i did the transfer portal from a couple of weeks, um, from the past couple of months where i just kind of start with that and then we get into the main meat of the show even still again thank you guys so much for joining in if you are not already please follow me on twitter i'm at cff underscore jared you can follow nate he is at cff nate if you're watching this on youtube like subscribe all that good jazz if you're listening to this on podcast follow all that good jazz Even so, thank you guys so much for listening in. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. God bless.